Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, I'm your host, Payman Askari. You're tuning in to In Lay Terms, and today we have with us Miss Karen Litsky. How are you doing? Good, thanks. How about you? I'm doing good. Um, did I <laughs> did I get your name right, or did I completely botch it? No, it's really it's 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 a lot simpler than it looks. Karen Litsky works fine for me. All right, so far so good. <laughs> Um, Ms. Litsky, uh, thank you for coming on. Um, can you, you, you told me uh, uh, you are the candidate of record for the BC Conservative Party. Can you, uh, can you tell us what exactly that means and uh, what led you down this course? Okay, so first of all, I'm one of many candidates of record. Candidate of record is basically the term used for somebody who's been on the ballot somewhere in an election and uh, and um, obviously, if you if you win, if you top the ballot, if you top the polls, if you win, you're 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 an MP or an MLA. If you're if not, you remain you you retain that status of having been on on an official ballot. Um, and also, yeah, for 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 a given party. So um, so the BC Conservatives um, are at kind of an inter actually a really interesting state of evolution. Um, and uh, and haven't actually run uh, in their current under their current leadership, um, which is uh, being led by John Rustad. Um, uh, haven't run in a general election, but there was a by-election called in my riding in uh, <clears throat> early 2023, and nobody else seemed interested in running. So I thought I would um, give it a shot, and. Um, and it was actually a, yeah, the riding of Vancouver Mount Pleasant is um, is an NDP stronghold riding, um, but it is changing a lot. And um, you know, even stalwart M NDP voters are are um, are changing their their uh, their views as as the world around us changes. And um, and obviously, there's a lot of densification happening. So there's new people moving into the neighborhood who have different outlooks. So, so it, it it's an interesting riding. But a by-election is always difficult because there's a very low voter turnout, um, uh, and um, so. But but we made a but we we made sort of a an impact. I think generally there was a simultaneous by-election happening on the island. Um, in the riding of Langford, I think, yeah, um, and um, and there the party play, the party's candidate Mike Harris placed placed much better, um, and I think the um, the party is really growing fast and really finding um, really resonating with a lot of voters as to speaking about speaking from a perspective that a lot of people have um, are increasingly coming to. So uh, it's my understanding that you, you ran federally for the PPC twice and you're running provincially for the BC United and I believe you've run... Conservative, conservative. <laughs> uh, BC Conservative, sorry. Um, uh, my, my bad, my apologies. Uh, and you've run a couple of other, uh, a couple of other times as well. My question is this: Where, where does the po where do you think people can make the most impact in their lives? Like, is Canada a sort of a country where provincially uh, more impactful decisions are made, or is it federal, in your opinion? You know, it's one of the things that um, kept me from running for public office much earlier in life was that I couldn't quite figure that question out, um, and I think the reality is. Uh, everything matters. Um, whatever people choose to do matters. Um, the currently the there are a number of issues that are like housing and healthcare that are showing how much it is. A, both levels of government have an effect, and in fact, the the major negotiation that we sort of live in the middle of is. I mean, that's it's re it really is a constant process of negotiation between the federal and the provincial governments, and and um, um, there's a degree of buck passing, uh, blame shifting, um, 
and and a and I happen to feel kind of a loss of perspective that it's it's always one one taxpayer's pocket that they're all dipping into. So it's a bit of a bit of a um, moot question. Who should you know when when uh, you know? It's funny. So my current MP is Jenny Kwan, and I've lived in this neighborhood for a long time. And she was the MLA prior to that. Um, and one of the things I've heard her, so I mean, she's been one of my elected representatives for like her entire time in politics, pretty much. And uh, so I've heard her a fair bit, and she quite often talks about cooperation between the three levels of government. She quite often, when she was in provincial politics, she said this is a federal responsibility and the federal government should be doing this and vice versa now. Um, so so the, I think the worst thing that can happen is that there's too much understanding between the three levels of government. They're supposed to actually be kind of adversarial. They're, they're supposed to be competing for how well they can meet the needs of, of, of the population as opposed to uh, getting together to, to um, uh, decide how best to engineer their goals in spite of the population. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I, it took me a long time to figure that out, and I, I, I veered to the federal uh, level for, the, for my first run in politics simply because that was where Maxime Bernier turned up. And he was really the first, uh, the fir- he, he created the first party that really sort of did what I felt I would do if, if I, you know, if I could create my dream party, that would have been it. Um, kind of running on these principles that could be applied to any issue that came up. Um, they kind of force, force you to think of, of, a, of a range of different needs and um, leave as much decision-making power as possible in the hands of the people living their lives. Um, so that was why I ended up with federal, but, but the, you know, the things like actually running, for example, the education system, which is pivotal, uh, in any location, uh, that's a provincial jurisdiction. And so if that sort of thing, um, and sort of uh, boots on the ground, policies about families and children, child welfare. Um, a lot of that stuff happens at the, the real hands-on stuff ha- happens at the provincial level. So I would say wherever people find their interests taking them and find the opportunities, uh, sort of the, just like you might choose the right job or the right spouse or the right house, you know, that's just a number of factors have to converge uh, and you just feel that it's the right place for you. I got the sense that you mentioned you'd run for a couple of different offices. Have you ever run for like school board? Mm-hmm. That was my one mun- municipal run was a run for school trustee last fall uh, for the Vancouver school board. Uh, I'm assuming you've lived, you were born in Canada and you've lived here all your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my my parents were new immigrants when I was born, so I'm first generation. Um, so I I speak another language. I speak German, um, but I uh, have lived yeah in Canada all my life. The the reason I ask, um, how do you find education's changed in this province or in Canada over the last I don't know thirty forty years? Well, so this isn't just a, pros- a, a product of my experience, and, and partly I think we shouldn't rely on our experience because it leads us to make a whole bunch of assumptions uh, about what we knew when we were children. So certainly what we experienced when we were children is real, um, but it's not always indicative of what was really going on because, after all, we were children and we didn't necessarily know what was uh, what was behind, you know, how decisions got made or whatever. Um, so, um, how have things changed? Yeah. So, so, well, let me give you a little bit of backstory of 
my involvement in the education system, which has been quite extensive. So, first of all, it's it's relevant actually that I'm the daughter of a teacher. So, um, so I kind of had an insider, a bit of an insider view of um, of, of of schools because m my dad was a teacher, um, and when I took my own kids to school, um, we had. My husband and I had just moved into sort of a it's it's it, it's a it, it's called an inner city neighborhood um kind of Strath, the Strathcona area and um and so so this school um had sort of a history of low performance um which was always assumed to be because of the demographics um but the teachers had said to themselves that they would <clears throat> had decided among themselves they should be getting better results with these kids. And so they challenged themselves to find a program, a teaching method that would work better. So they they came across, they found something, they implemented it for a year. They were quite pleased. Um, they, they committed to it uh, as a whole school. And then, um, and it kind of spread a little bit to a couple of other schools in the inner city. And then I started to watch as the entire education infrastructure uh, did its utmost to take this program down. Um, so it became clear that the system as a whole has a strong preference for failure. Uh, it did not want these children being that successful. And, um, and it was interesting to see where the opposition to the program came from, uh, how it was framed, um, and then how it was achieved. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, um, so, so I had graduated with, uh, with an MBA just a few years before, well, right before I had my kids. And, uh, so I kind of took my, my understanding of organizations and I said, there's, this is weird that the system prefer, prefers failure. Why is that? And, um, and, uh, so I spent probably... 15 years while I was ushering my kids through school, um, doing a whole bunch of background reading and research about how the system works, what are, what, what, what are its sort of theoretical underpinnings, what's the literature say uh, within, you know, educational, education faculties. Um, what what's the theory? Um, what are the policies? What are the laws? And so I I did really a deep dive into everything education for fifteen or twenty years, and um, and uh, so when you ask how how have things changed in say forty years, um, there there were a number of there, there's constant change first of all. And each of those changes to me has has degraded something in the system, um, um, and even when it's been intended for the best, it's often just um, had a had, had a an unintended consequence that that overtook the the good intentions. Um, so we've seen, for example. Uh, like there was a time where we saw the growth of teachers' union power, and then in the 1980s, or more at the end of the 80s and the 90s in BC, that power, the teachers' union power, changed from being local to being provincial. And so a whole different dynamic occurred at the school level because it used to be that trustees and the local teachers' union would negotiate the teachers' union contract and a whole bunch of things uh, like um, that about working conditions, such as such as the size of classes, um, and 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 you have a certain amount of built-in local accountability when that's the case because you know the union president who I don't know takes teachers out on strike or something or negotiates a certain type of of uh, classroom organization has to the local people know that that person and and they they meet up in Safeway and so the union president has to face has to face the public but move it to the provincial level and that that uh, layer of that sort of 
personal accountability completely disappears. Um, hardly anybody ever sees the union president uh, in, you know, Costco or Walmart or Safeway or whatever. Um, and uh, and so, um, so that's a, something that I think people didn't really even, like most people couldn't even put their finger on the fact that that happened at this stage. Um, and yet it made a, a signature difference in in um, how much public input there is uh, to, and, and how much the conditions that prevail in the schools actually meet the needs of the people who are attending the schools. Um, I'm just trying to think of what are some of the other sort of important things. Probably one of the most important that we don't realize how, how different this once was um, is the integration of special needs students. And it's not just special needs students. Up until about the 60s, there were reform schools. And, um, and so kids that were sort of difficult to manage, behavioral problems of various kinds, were taken to the reform schools. Now, it's really important to say that these rep reform schools, first of all, were brutal places. They, um, there was not much of a public window onto what went on inside them. And since these kids were difficult to manage, um, you can count on the fact that they were, they were managed using unorthodox methods um, and probably didn't have much of a budget. Um, and probably the worst thing about these schools, too, is that a lot of the kids who got sent to them didn't need to be sent to them. They weren't they weren't, they were just, you know, they were standing out for one reason or another. They were a little slow academically, or maybe they were shy, or, I mean, all kinds of, um, it was really a brutal, repressive environment. Um, and I think if you dug, you could find a lot of kids who got sent there who shouldn't have been. And perhaps if they hadn't been, then there would have been a smaller cohort and it might have been possible to do something meaningful for the kids that did need to be there. Um, you know, hard to say, but so, so you, so I can say that the, the, uh, the abolition, the gradual abolition of these reform schools is probably a good thing, but the solution was not necessarily to put all those kids back into the mainstream classroom. And that has increasingly happened. And the other type of uh, separated school that there was was one for kids with disabilities. And again, um, these were not great places for these for, for disabled kids. Um, uh, there, there are there were some uh, sex, sex abuse scandals and and again, I think there were probably some kids who did not need to be there who could have been accommodated in mainstream classrooms. Um, so these were, but, but what it did was so that when I, when I was going to school, there was an illusion that, um, that there weren't those kinds of kids, you know, that, that these behavioral outliers or the disabled kids, um, that, you know, you, you didn't, you didn't see them in the mainstream. Um, and so what we've done in the intervening um, 50 years, let's say, is that we've increasingly moved all those kids back into the mainstream, or not back into, into the mainstream classroom. Um, but we've done it under this policy of integration, which means that, um, that, that everybody, like, like everybody's in there, and we don't even have a category anymore for kids who shouldn't be in there for one reason or another. Um, I've heard stories from teachers of kids being, of comatose kids being wheeled in with an IV running into the classroom. Um, and I, you know, I, I won't, I, I, I won't verify that, but that, that was a, it was a first person account, um, that I believed. Um, and there's just this idea that the classroom is sort of a place that everybody belongs with the result that, it's not really a functional place anymore because if you look at any workplace, any kind of a self, any 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 functional place in in society, you select people into it in with some criteria, 
And you don't just pack everybody in there and say everybody qualifies. Um, you know, the, the universities that are coming up with these, um, with these theories aren't as integrated as they're making the classrooms, right? So we're asking kids to do things that, that we're not, that adults aren't doing. Um, so, um, so the extremely integrated classroom is something that has changed the student experience and it's also changed the teacher experience. Um, one of education's dirty little secrets is how many teachers uh, go off on stress leave because the conditions are just untenable. And this is with one of the most strongest unions in the country ostensibly negotiating their working conditions. Um, and yet, uh, and yet that's, that's the reality that the working conditions are, are still so arduous that a lot of, I mean, there's a, there's always concern for how, how many teachers are leaving the occupation and, um, and those that stay, yeah, it, it, it eventually grinds them down because it is really, really a tough environment to teach in. I think it's gotten a lot harder. Uh, again, this is where it becomes relevant that my dad was a teacher. Um, and so I have some visceral understanding of what teachers were facing at that time. And it's a lot worse. It's a lot more difficult now than it was back then. So that's a long answer to your short question. No, that's good. Uh, I wanted to go back to way back at the beginning. You were you mentioned something that never occurred to me. Uh, unions used to be local, and then they went provincial. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if this is from your childhood or or if you can you speak more to that. Like, how did that happen? Were people aware, or people just didn't care? Well, let me uh, let me qualify that a little bit. There's another really important um, uh, watershed in in all our public system, dis discussing all our public systems, and that is that up until about 1960, unions were um, were only private sector, and it was only in about 1960, in the 1960s, that there started to be organization in the public sector. Now, um, now again, this is one of those things where you have to go in with a with an understanding of both sides of the argument to sort of properly track track the tra trajectory. So, so government employees didn't have any representation, um, didn't have a bargaining unit, and um, and that obviously um, led to various inequities and abuses because we're human, and that's what humans do. Um, the um and and if you go back into union history i'm not entirely so so you know i mean the american um yeah the history of private sector unions is a completely it's a separate thing and the sort of they didn't always start locally sometimes it would be a larger organization that then would would move in and organize locally like so the private sector union history is i'm just going to leave that aside because it's not uh, that doesn't necessarily um, apply to the teachers' unions, which I'll talk about here. Um, but um, so in so in BC, um, in the it was the short-lived NDP government of David Barrett that brought in um, uh, public sector unionism in BC. If if I understand correctly. I'm not sure if that would have needed federal legislation as well. I'm not. I that I don't know. But um, but up until that point, the BC Teachers Federation had been an association of teachers um, for a good portion of its life. It was a voluntary association of teachers, and it was all about teaching. It was about hey, I've found this great resource for you know here's how or here's how an exercise I did with my kids for cursive writing or, um, or, or, um, and, and certainly also politics, uh, history, it kept teachers, I think, knowledgeable and connected in a really important way. Um, and up until now I'm, I'm, I'm fuzzy on the numbers, but I think it was the forties up until then it was voluntary. And I think it became a mandatory membership for BC teachers in public schools, 
sometime in the 40s, but don't quote me on that. Um, but the bargaining was always local, so the unions were local. And if you look in reality, certainly there was coordination through the BC Teachers Federation among local bargaining units, um, and that enabled uh, teacher bargaining to probably outsmart um, and outcompete the trustees um, on more than one occasion and for way too long. Um, because what they would do... Um, uh, now, so I should say there was a... So, so let me just keep stay on the trajectory. In about 19... I think it was in 1987... Um, that the BC Teachers Federation became a bargaining agent um, as opposed to just an association. And, um, and uh, but it only bargained certain things provincially and the rest still stayed at the local level. And um, so that balance kind of defined the period between like 87 and, I don't know, 2001 or something. There's a whole bunch of politics and legal cases and stuff that goes on around there. Um, but the, the implications really were that anything that any decisions that are made by the BC Teachers Federation have always been out of the public eye and they are out of the public accountability loop. So when, when the BC Teachers Federation or any union, in any, any teachers union in any province becomes super powerful, um, and polit especially to the extent of being able to, say, control school board politics, to con because they're, they, they became very adept at, um, at um, getting sort of favorable trustees elected, so they would basically... Because, you know, school board uh, elections are not that people don't, a lot, the voting turnout for them is quite low. So it's fairly easy if you get all your teachers to turn out and vote. Um, you you have a fair impact on, on the outcome. Um, and um, so, so the more things move, as I said earlier, the more things move to the provincial level uh, and the more power the BC Teachers Federation has at that level, um, the less the less say the public has just by default. You know, you could have 100% of the parents at your school saying, okay, we want such and such um, in terms of how the classes are organized. But if it's in the BC Teachers Federation's contract, um, you can't get it because there's a labor board that'll enforce the contract, it'll force the government to comply with the contract, and the people don't get what they, get what they want. Um, kind of leads into my next, uh, and I promise this is the last question I have about education. This is turning into the uh, public education hour. Um, was there ever a time when the schools, public schools, were funded locally and the curriculum was set locally? Or was it just from you know the, the time we were cast out of the Garden of, of Eden, <laughs> we, we, everything was provincial? Um, that is a good question, and I'm not... I'm not the person to answer it. I'd, I'd have to go. I'd have to go to some sources. And one of the one of the um, things about education is that there's there's patterns uh, that that apply, you know, across uh, across the world, really. Um, so a lot of education history uh, dips into different jurisdictions. So there's like if you look into your education theories, you're automatically reading. American sources, which are reflecting American school board policies and politics, um, where that probably has been the case. In, in Canada, I believe uh, it has been a provincial responsibility from the time that a province joined Confederation. Um, I, don't think, I don't think that local school boards ever had like straight-up curriculum um, control, I don't believe. All right. Um, I, I, let's shift gears. Uh, 
Everyone's talking about this online harms bill. Um, are you are you aware of it? Am I pronouncing it right? Or is it? Um, I'm certainly aware of it. I have not sat down and read it. Um, uh, I I kind of share the overall distrust of of uh, of what's coming down the pipe. But I, I I can't don't consider myself a source at the moment. It looks it looks pretty alarming. I will say. Um, I I just what I have seen is not confidence inducing. Uh, when, when I kind of started my path towards, let's just say, politics two, two and a half years ago, every time the, the Liberals uh, un, unveiled this other monstrosity of some tyrannical document, I, I'd get hyper-anxiety and I'd, I'd research it. Now I'm just like, you know, just add it to the pile. So the, <laughs> the, the mission right now is just to get them out. But this one, it's, it's really alarming because they want to put people in prison for life for advocating genocide like and i don't i'm not sure what that means like somebody pointed out you know saying from the river to the sea palestine will be free here <laughs> like, is that advocating genocide what, what are your views on that yeah i <clears throat> i can't speak to how it will be interpreted um <clears throat> obviously it will be interpreted a lot more broadly than we'd like to what i will say is that um i um it kind of does uh, draw back to, to, to education, but um, I don't know if you caught uh, this extraordinary interview that Tucker Carlson did recently with this woman named um, G. Van Fleet. She's just re she's a she's a survivor of Mao's Cultural Revolution in China, and lives now has lived in the states since since about 1986, I think. And she's just written a book called Mao's America that talks about how that she's seeing distinct parallels between the Cultural Revolution and and what's going on in the States and to the extent that all Western cultures share certain certain um, attributes uh, I, I would take that warning um, to heart certainly here and in many other places um, and one of the most interesting one of the most interesting things she talked talks about is how Mao basically started off by weaponizing children against the adults that he wanted to control. And so that's why I am, uh, you know, we, we've, we've been watching this in schools, this process in schools of kids being, yeah, it's less about teaching and more about indoctrinating. And without saying, oh my God, that's where we are, because we don't know that we're there. And we don't know even that that we're going there. Um, you know, if I indulge in a moment of optimism, um, but certainly we can see what that can lead to, um, and uh, and so I find that a really useful data point to put us alongside this proposed bill. Um, and then also watching what's been happening in human rights tribunals and courts and what language has been able to sort of slipstream into law. So now, you you know, in order to put somebody into prison, um, you'd have to have really novel defi definitions of words like harm and safety and um, genocide and, and those, those, that terminology has really, you know, I mean, I've been watching legal cases uh, in, in um, I don't know, these, what do you call them, the kind of the woke legal cases, let's say, or the social justice legal cases, and just watching what they've been able to get the courts to say and do. Um, and, uh, and it'll be interesting to see how, if and how, um, those pieces all come together. And, and what they leave us with, um, certainly, yeah, we're watching with uh, with, with um, concern as as uh, Putin puts his his um, adversaries in jail, um, and as happens in actually many dictatorial jurisdictions, and uh, you start to wonder whether, yeah, will will there be another <laughs> will there be another election? Um, 
we may be closer to that point than we think. I hope we're not, but we may be. I, I, I've been thinking a lot about like right or wrong or what constitutes a crime because we're, we're starting to accuse our enemies of doing what we're doing. Like we have, we have two people now in, in prison after two years because of the Kutz protest, which was highly political. And we're looking across the ocean at Putin saying he's done this, that, or the other. And then in the U.S., they're going after their political adversary, Trump. But I don't know. I mean, I could go on and on forever. But um, I guess my question is, did you, did you read the Mosley decision? Were you aware of it? The one that uh, uh, said the Emergency Measures Act was unlawful. And what were your thoughts? Um, well, I must say it um, did I read the whole decision? I don't think so. Um, but um, <clears throat> I would say that uh, it gave me a moment of um, renewed confidence in the courts. Um, and what I really liked was that the judge actually came out and said uh, that he this had not been his his opinion coming in and that he uh, had been persuaded by the arguments that were put before him. And this really plays to one of my hobby horses, which is how important it is for people to take their uh, complaints and injuries to the courts. And we've, I think we have been remiss you know, if we think we've handed over the schools to the activists, if we think we've handed over health care to the activists, we did the same in the courts. And and the law, most of us don't understand the law. And I am, up until I was about 50, um, that was me. I didn't really understand how it worked at all as an organic thing. And uh, And then circumstances sort of took me to the courts as a self-represented litigant in an education case as it happens. And, um, and from there I, I, I was on, you know, I started up this steep learning curve, um, kind of lurching from one hapless court application to the next, trying to establish a place for the public interest in teacher bargaining cases. Um, and, and so as I learned uh, about the courts and started to read more and more case law, I became aware of how, how strategically uh, the sort of activist contingent, I'll use that word for lack of a better shorthand, um, has, how strategically they've been using the, the courts. And they've been, so they've been getting their language entrenched in law, as I said earlier, they have been... Um, creating little little handholds or touchstones of um, of uh, principle of the principles they want to eventually build up to and um, and you know it's not a necessarily a bad thing for them to have done that but what is bad is that it was done without the public without a real public representative in court because it was always done versus governments um, and governments are in court uh, specifically on, I mean, they're not really representing the public. Like, especially in a labor case, they're in court as the employer. Um, and they always, have, they always have responsibility for a system uh, or, or a, a policy or legislation or something not they're not actually the the targeted um and affected group when it comes to any particular um uh piece of legislation or any particular lawsuit and so um in my opinion it's really important for the public to go to court and i god knows i know how difficult it is having done it many times it's hard to find a lawyer. It's hard to raise the money. Um, it's uh, and it's even harder to self-represent. Um, but you know, the judges have gone decades. The judiciary as a whole has gone decades hearing 
mostly, if not only, from affected special interest groups that are, that are creating, that are carving their little fiefdom out of the public sphere. And, and we're not there defending our territory. And um, so, so I actually think one of the most important things about that decision, um, because of course it, it can go to appeal and it can, um, uh, it can be, uh, it, it, it can be overridden by other, by another decision um, of some sort. Um, uh, that's the most important point. A judge actually saying, yes, I was persuaded I thought one thing, but then I was persuaded by the arguments put before me. And so uh, it's worth going to court and putting arguments before a judge. Uh, you know, and you're not always successful the first time. It's so the other thing we learn from, if you look at the, the uh, special interest group litigation history, they don't always win. They didn't always win the first time out. They just kept doing it and doing it and doing it until they found, until they got a little foothold uh, and then they would build on that, doing it again. Um, so, yeah, we need to be in the courts. What do you think is going to happen if it if it goes next up is the appeals court, and if it get, gets to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says that it was lawful? What do you think is going to happen to Canada? Um, yeah, that's it. It becomes speculative, and I I I tend, I, I guess I tend not to. I don't know if I tend not to speculate, but um, I am an optimist, <laughs> and uh, I think that's one thing that you know keeps me going um, and keeps me uh, encouraging others to keep going. Is that I mean, you have to be an optimist. If you if you're just a pessimist, you automatically you become kind of fatalistic and passive. And there's certain things to be fatalistic about. Um, I think I'm a lot more fatalistic about about um you know climate than than most people um but i'm um but when it comes to uh public affairs um i'm i have to be optimistic and keep putting some energy into where i think it could go so my sense would be the way i would look at it would be this if it goes to appeal there's an opportunity, I think, for intervention bids. I don't know the federal court. I know the, um, I know the um, provincial supreme and appeal courts. But generally, at the appeal level, there's an opp opportunity to intervene. So any group that has a concern should be starting to talk to a lawyer and put together an intervener bid if, if it does go to appeal. And same at the Supreme Court of Canada. They should be flooded with intervener applications because there should be literally no group of Canadians that doesn't have uh, a say and a, 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 a yeah something to say about about um, uh, a, about whether those measures should be whether that should should be considered illegal well let, let's bring it back uh, you said you're running as the candidate of record for Mount Pleasant is that correct okay so I am the candidate of record I'm not at this point slated to run in the next provincial election, but I'm I'm not ruling it out either. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, if you if it comes down to it and you run, like what is it? Why are you running? What are your principles? And what is it about the, um, some of the legislation that the NDP have put forth that you would disagree with? Provincially. Um, well, yeah, so there are certainly specific pieces of uh, legislation, but um, more than that, there are, um, it's sort of our, our baseline. And, you know, the education system, if we were to sort of create it now and put it before the people and say, uh, should we should we set this up and make it mandatory for kids to attend? I think your answer would overwhelmingly be no. Um, the, the there are a number of things that have become um, accept excuse me accepted um, uh, 
uh, taken for granted that they must be this way, and and we need to we, we need to um, question some of those. And so um, one of the things I would hope to be able to achieve if if I were elected and if the Conservatives did form government would be to um, to look at some of those assumptions and see if see if they hold. I mean, we talk so much about the science, right? The science of this, the science of teaching, the science of reading, the science of whatever. Everybody's like, well, the science says this, the science says that, the science of transgenderism, the science of whatever. Um, but the one thing that there is no science for is whether it is really the right the best way to raise kids to put them into an institution away from their parents for 200 days a year for 13 years between the ages of 6 and 18. There's no science. No science for that at all. No science supporting that one bit. Um, and what, even if you stay, start with half-day kindergarten, if you, um, and then this, you know, 9 to 3, is that really a great schedule for kids? For all kids? Um, there's no science. So it's it's an entirely talk about uh, talk about a social construct. Um, school is the ultimate social construct, and we assume every single thing about it. Um, we've become completely um, uh, acclimatized to all these things, and um, and even if we take it as even if we do accept the premise that kids should be raised with a school system of some sort, um, that there is one model that should suit all kids is absolutely, again, an assailable, um, uh, an assail one schedule, one model, uh, absolutely an assailable uh, construct. And, and so I really feel that we need to start challenging not just the legislation that's created. Certainly, these things are entrenched in legislation, and so the legislation needs to be looked at. But our, our fundamental assumptions about how to raise kids, um, I think we need to start questioning them at, at, at a government level um, and making room for people to try new things. Uh, well, this is something that's really... Um really important to me what is the logic behind compulsory education like how do they pitch that and when did this come out like this is not something i don't think it's even in our lives this is a long time ago yeah 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 the as far as i can get to the original premise is that um well you have to start with what kids lives were beforehand and and I think the it was always a little bit of a middle class do gooder instinct um, that and it was always about okay these the poor kids uh, the kids of disadvantaged families were either having um, lives that were you know they were either having to work as children or they were um, intellectually deprived relative to the more affluent peers. Um, so there was a lot of concern and legitimate concern for how well uh, sort of the disadvantaged segments of society were doing. And if you go deep into the, the U.S. history, uh, there was a lot of religious concern because it was not just whether kids could read for the sake of intellectual development, it was whether they could read their scriptures and therefore would they, you know, be able to, um, um, I, I, I don't know what the, you know, I mean, it, it was that the, is it God or the devil kind of a, kind of a dichotomy and they would be at, at da in danger of, um, of uh, succumbing to, to the lure of the devil if they couldn't read their scriptures or something. I'm not quite sure. Um, but it's one of the most interesting things about the history is that there's a strong religious impulse to, um, to uh, universal schooling. Um, and, and then I think there's a, number, there's a number of ways to look at it, ranging from the extremely cynical to the not that cynical. Um, 
the basic do-gooder impulse would always have been, well, um, if it's good for most kids, then uh, making it compulsory, you know, everybody should, everybody must uh, be able to access, or everybody must have this benefit, therefore it should be compulsory. If it's good for some, it, it'll, it'll be good for all. Um, and if you're more cynical about it, then it becomes, um, you can look at the economics of it, um, where you, you know, communities had built these school buildings and, uh, and invested in the teacher, and now you needed to fill the classroom. Um, and there's an interesting dynamic in the, in the backstory of teacher training, which is that initially, uh, you basically were qualified to be a teacher once you, I don't know, came out of, got, came out of school yourself and did a couple of years of, a year or two of, of college. Um, and, um, and, uh, then there was something called the normal schools for probably quite a while in the, probably the early 1900s, they called them normal schools. So you would go and do a couple of years of teacher training in a normal school. So that, I don't know, don't ask me why they were called normal, but, um, but, uh, and there was a, there was a, the faculties of education in universities had been um, founded, they, they started up around 1900, give or take, uh, give or take a decade or two. And, um, and so the professors were publishing books and theories, and they wanted the teachers in the public schools to use those, buy their books and use those theories. And uh, and increasingly, they began offering training to teachers as well. And by about 1950, the normal schools had died out, and and teacher training had moved entirely into the university. And a lot of the uh, a lot of the negatives in education can be traced to that change, because the normal schools were all about here's how you teach kids and to do x right and the meanwhile in the education faculties the professors were coming up with these theories and then teaching them to the teachers who would go out and try them so the feed there wasn't the same feedback loop you didn't have experienced teachers teaching aspiring teachers here's how you teach kids to do x um you had you, you put these education professors into the into the loop and it all became theoretical um, so, so yeah, why did it become compulsory? Um, you know, you could never, I think it was always a, a way to, probably always a way to control people. Um, you always had, you had, I don't know, you might have had extreme little religious factions, you might have had, um, sort of, um, yeah, families that were really living on the fringes of, of um, civilization, um, and you wanted to draw them all into the fold, and you did that via their kids. You know, you got you got control of their kids. Would be my, would, you know, my take on what I've read so far. So we're we're getting near close to the end of the show. Um, one last question. <laughs> Mr. John Rusted, what kind of a person is he? Have you met him? Yes, uh, yes. I I was actually it was really neat to run in a by election because um, in a general election as a candidate you're one of the whole slate of candidates and you don't get um, nearly the attention from the party or the leader that you do if you're one, you know you're, you're just the only by election going on or one of two in my case. So um, he was in the riding several times, and he um, he had some strategic advice in terms of uh, what what we uh, what we put in the in the campaign, um, and uh, and I I find him amazing. So he's he's in Northern MLA, and I'm in Vancouver, and I've always been in Vancouver, and he had really flown under my radar for um for his he's been in office for 20 years but um he as i say he'd really flown under my radar i was very focused on education and not on the 
on the areas that he was um, active in. And so, uh, so to sort of meet him at this stage of his career is really neat. He's, he's, he's a very impressive guy. And he's one of those people where you, you don't necessarily, um, like he's a little understated. Um, but, uh, but when you ask him a question or when he has a, has something to suggest, um, it's bang on. He's um, he's he's a really he's really good at um, uh, getting to the to the heart of the matter and and I think making the suggestion that will will have the most impact. Um, so I he, he's really tuned in. I find to. Um, how constituents are thinking, um, and uh, and what matters the most to them. So I'm I'm really impressed, like sincerely impressed, uh, with with his, his the capacity he brings to the table. Um, I won't mention their names, but I know two people that have uh, submitted their applications to run as candidates for the BC Conservative Party, and I really like. It's my understanding that Mr. Rustad uh, stood on principle, refused to denounce the truckers and then he got kicked out of caucus is that accurate he actually got kicked out because i think i think because he he um it was i think it was a climate tweet and it was something that was fairly uh germane to his constituency which has a lot of farmers in it and it was about uh, it, it was about fertilizer um uh there was about reducing the use of fertilizer or i i can't remember what that kick was that Trudeau was on, um, but yeah, getting kicked out of that caucus is, I think, the best thing that has happened. Him getting kicked out of that caucus is probably the best thing that's happened to the province in a long time. Well, uh, let's hope that he. Um, first of all, let's hope he does become premier. If not, uh, that he he can pick up a lot of seats. Um, Miss uh, Litsky, I, I hope that you also end up running. You're not not just a candidate of record. Uh, is there is there any way uh, our viewers can learn a little bit more about you? Do you have a, a website, or should they go on Twitter? Well, Twitter is probably the best place, um, uh, and there's a link from my Twitter bio, and my Twitter handle is just my name uh, with no space. Um, and um, there's a um, yeah, there's a link from my Twitter bio to my bio on the uh, Conservative Party of BC website. Um, and I believe there's contact information there. And if not, I can certainly be tweeted at or DM'd on Twitter anytime. That's probably the easiest way to contact me. Well, uh, Miss Litsky, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed the chat.